watching with us online. It is time for our weekly announcements. Today is step three of our Freedom Growth Track. In step three, we will learn to develop your leadership. We'll meet upstairs after service in our growth track room for 30 minutes. Snacks and childcare are provided. Our Freedom Kids will be selling Krispy Kreme donuts in the month of March to support BGMC. This is an awesome way to raise money for children all around the world to hear the gospel of Jesus. We thank you for considering buying a box of donuts in the upcoming weeks. If you want all this information and more, please follow us on Instagram and Facebook and visit our website, freedomchurchchattanooga.com. This is my music that plays me in. I forgot it completely. Um, sorry. I want to give you one quick announcement. Uh, we are doing a fundraiser today. Uh, many of you have bought tickets that were out front. Let me say it this way. There, there is no more food. So it, the tickets are bought. So you can't go back and eat. But we do want to invite you to the bake sale that will begin as soon as we get into that room, okay? They're going to have all kinds of items that you can buy. Uh, it'll be pretty quick as they do the auction, so then you can, those of you that did not buy tickets to eat lunch during that time, uh, you can move on in. I know that's a little awkward. I'm sorry, but, I mean, they've sold everything, so I, I can't, there's just no way to do it, okay? Um, so please come to the auction. There's space for you. Make sure that if you do come to the auction and you're not going to eat the lunch, that there are special chairs for you to sit in, okay? Everybody with me on that? Give me a thumbs up, like you understand what I'm saying? Okay, good. Um, and uh, we'll start that right after we uh, end the service. Let me also say that Emily is out of town this weekend. She wanted me to tell you that she is missing you. She's already texted me a few times, uh, just saying that she's praying for the services and wish that she could be here. Uh, she is suffering for Jesus on the Florida coast with my sister at her beach home. Um, but she is working. She, she's decorating. She's probably watching this right now. Um, I'll be good. So she is, she is decorating their house for them, and so it is a work trip um, on the beach, but, you know. Okay, so anyway, moving right along. Uh, I've got some, some well-known proverbs, and uh, this is just kind of a funny thing. A first-grade teacher had 25 students in her class. She presented each child in her class the first half of a well-known proverb and asked them to come up with the remainder of the proverb, and here are their responses. It's always darkest before daylight savings time. If you lie down with dogs, you'll stink in the morning. A penny saved is not much. <laughs> there are none so blind as Stevie Wonder. Children should be seen and not spanked or grounded. If at first you don't succeed, get new batteries. You get out of something only what you see in the picture on the box. And when the blind lead the blind, get out of the way. <laughs> We've been in a talk, uh, we started last week, and uh, we were talking about compassion. Now, if you remember last week, I'm going to give you a little recap real quick as we jump into this talk today. First off, we talked about some hashtags that we would like you guys to use during this conversation that we're having. When I say a conversation, hopefully what is being said from the pulpit always spurs conversation within your home or with other people in the congregation that you don't just hear what I'm saying and walk out of here on Sunday and do nothing with it. So there's a conversation that we started last week about compassion, and hopefully you're having a conversation with the Lord as well, but as you go out of this room, and I wanna explain a little bit more about my message from last week, um, in just a moment, we ask you that you use these hashtags as you're on social media. Like if something happens or a moment, uh, we are not asking you to go out and take selfies with homeless people and promote that on uh, the web. Every, nobody laughs at that. Like it, y'all are just really today. Um, don't go out and promote and take advantage of this, but it is to start the conversation or to write you know, what happened in the moment and use the hashtag so that it goes to our church people and everybody in the church can see it. I'll just give you a perfect example. We left here um, last week and we had moved all the pews out and we were going to grab some lunch with a group from the church and then we went over to Walmart and it was me and Emily and Samuel. We were buying some groceries. We were in line. It was really, really packed um, for some reason. It was just really busy uh, mid-afternoon, Sunday afternoon. And 
and we're going through the line, and I was just grabbing the bags and loading up the cart, and I happened to look up at the end of our time right before we were about to pay and noticed that the lady at the cash register had about a golf ball-sized growth on her neck right under here, underneath her jawline. And I had not noticed it until that moment. And if you were here last week, you have to remember that I had a chair up here and I had a weighted blanket and had Pastor Greg up here with all of these excuses uh, stuck on him of why we don't reach out in compassion. And every single one of them began to run, run through my head as I was standing there thinking, we need to pray for this woman, but look at this long line behind her with all of these groceries, and what if management gets mad? And do we have enough time to stop what's going on right now in this moment? I mean, all of these excuses that I told you to not take and to throw them off and actually move in compassion were running through my head. So I had a moment of, should I listen to my own words and reach out? And in the middle of my thinking, Emily says, can we pray for you? And so, you know, um, we, we took about 10 seconds or so. We just reached over and, and prayed for her. And she said, you wouldn't believe the amount of people that come through the line and ask to pray for me about this. And I'm praying that it goes away without having to do surgery. I've cut it out once before. It's come back. So we started this conversation. Not one person in the line got upset. And there were about three or four people in line with a lot of groceries. Not one person from management came over. It was a quick moment, a response of reaching out. And to us, listen, we can think it's a huge deal. Or, or that we, oh, I don't know if I can do this or not. And we can just kind of walk away sometimes. But I'm telling you, it's a huge thing to God when he spurs your heart in compassion to reach out to someone that you don't just walk away. That you actually reach out in compassion. Let me give you the definition from last week. It was, um, if you look at the C-O-M on the beginning of passion, this is what it means. It's a prefix that means with, together, in association, and with intensive force. That's what compassion means as a definition, that we should reach out in compassion. I told you the story last week, and I won't take time to go all the way through it again, but about the roadrunner Remember that it was trapped in the building, died in the building, and God said, if I, what I'm pouring out in the building stays in the building, it will die in the building. What God does in this room has to have a way out. It can't just be a blessing club that we come together on Sundays and we get our thing from God and then we don't do anything with it when we walk out of this place today. So this conversation about compassion has everything to do with you doing something with it when you leave. The majority of the ministry that you see Jesus doing was not done in a synagogue. It was done on the streets. It was done around a lake. It was done in different areas that were outside of the church. And we're to be like him. I'm already starting to preach at you. So with that said, we covered the first part of Luke chapter 10 last week. And we're gonna start with verse 25 because we're gonna talk about the conversation that happens after the beginning of this where I said, you know, he sent the 70 people out and he saw Lucifer fall from the sky. It actually brought the kingdom of darkness down when they went out and moved in compassion and, and gave them the kingdom of God. So verse 25 says this, and a lawyer stood up and put him to the test saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what is written in the law? How does it read to you? I love that response. How does it read to you? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Let's stop for just a moment because I've, I've heard churches, I've heard ministers, I've heard messages that will basically simplify this down to love God, love people. I mean, you guys have probably heard this before. Um, hopefully, you're looking at me like maybe you haven't, but hopefully you have. Love God, love people. Um, this is a response in Luke chapter 10 where someone asks the question, Jesus says, why don't you give me a response? But when you look in the gospel of Matthew, Jesus answers this same question. There was a question that says, which is the greatest commandment? Now listen to his words. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments, which means the whole Old Testament. 
hinges on loving God well and loving people well. Now, here's the thing before we even talk about the Good Samaritan and the story that we're about to dig into today is that you have to understand when God says, love me well and love your neighbor well, a lot of times we can't love our neighbor because we don't love ourselves well. And the context of this, if you think about the greatest commandment and the second one is like it, is that when we really dig into relationship with the Lord, when we're really leaning in and we're spending a lot of time with God and he is changing us, then when he begins to change us, what's happening to us is that we don't see ourselves the way that we have seen ourselves. We begin to see ourselves the way God sees us. Everything that God has done, he has put on the inside of you. Do you understand that everything on the inside of you, every the way that you look, every gift and calling that's been placed on the inside of you was put there by a God that cares deeply about every single detail. Let me just use one example. He says, Jesus says this in the Gospels, he knows every single hair on your head. Do you guys realize that that would be humanly impossible almost to call someone up here and for me to go through every single hair on their head and and keep up with the count and actually know like at the end of it that I didn't mess up and that you know if I had to double check it's going to take us days to be able to to do this and that's just one example of how God says I love you that much I'm going to take care of you I know every detail of your life And so many times, we're not in good relationship with God. We're not close enough to him to really honestly begin to love people the way that he loves people. Because we can't love ourselves well, we don't love other people well. It's just the truth of what Jesus is saying here. And this guy responds based off of a conversation that Jesus already had about the greatest commandment. And he says, this is good. It's a good statement. And then... It says that he wants to be justified. So as we jump into this story of the Good Samaritan, I'm gonna pick it up in verse 30. And the the lawyer asked the question, who's my neighbor? And Jesus begins with this story. Jesus replied and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers and they stripped him and beat him and went away leaving him half dead. And by chance, a priest was going down on that road and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, who was on a journey, came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion, and came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them, and he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he he took out two denarii, which is two days' wages, and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him and whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, the one who showed mercy toward him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do the same. I want you to watch this quick video. The word commands us. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your passion. Every thought aligned with his, moved with others for compassion. Love your neighbor as yourself. That leaves us with just one question. Who is my neighbor? 7.8 billion hearts beat every day. Lungs expand, legs bend, eyes learn to obey. These living, breathing, soul-filled creatures, God's mark made evident in carefully laid features. Is our neighbor our friend, or is he our foe? Perhaps the answer lies in the man set for Jericho. Attacked by robbers, stripped and beaten, left there for dead, broken and bleeding. Passed by by priests and Levites, the righteous, too dirty, inconvenient to reach out in a crisis. This man needed a neighbor, but he got locked out, lying desperate for a savior, and not one would reach out, except for the Samaritan. An adversary, an enemy, a rival, a foe, stopped dead in his tracks for one he did not know. He could have kept walking, ignored him, and gone, sat safely at home with his curtains all drawn. But love cried out louder than comfort or fear. He was moved with compassion to pull an enemy near. 
He said, this is my neighbor. On you, I have mercy. There's no list of criteria for you to be worthy. Love can't be extended in measures or parts. It's all in headlong, not a finish and start. Real love's not earned by our money and fashion. So go and do likewise. Go show compassion. That's good. Because of this video, I'm not just telling you a story that Jesus told over 2,000 years ago. It makes it relevant to us that we understand that we are still in the same culture and he still asks the same question. And he says, go do likewise. Go and share compassion with those that are around you. That we don't look at just a great story that Jesus told that doesn't seem as relevant to us as it may have to that day. And I wanna talk about this story for a moment and then I wanna put it in context of, of bringing it into the year of 2020. Uh, first off, when you look at this story, you have to understand that when he's talking to this group of people, he's teaching a group of Jewish people, and he says, a priest comes by, which would be like the lead priest, okay, like the lead person, lead lead pastor. Uh, then a Levite comes by. If you understand Levite culture, they were the only tribe that could work in the house of the Lord. Um, so it would be like an associate pastor comes by or a, maybe a, a freedom team member comes by that's serving in our house, that works in the house of the Lord in some capacity, that they walk by and both of them pass them up. But there's a huge twist that happens right here. Like they can, they're trekking with him. Okay, yeah, I got it. Priest comes by, Levite comes by, then a Samaritan, and they're like, hold up. Like, where is he going with this story? See, the Samaritans there was a lot of racial tension that was going on because the Jewish people believed the Samaritans to be uh, like a half race, like half Jewish, half something else. Now, the Samaritans actually were a group of people that claimed to be like Jewish or from the descendants of Ephraim and Manasseh, which were Joseph's sons, okay? So they claimed to be from the tribe, but they were not, Pure as a Jewish race, I guess is what you would say, is that there's probably some intermingling in with some other cultures, which was against God's law, if you go back and read. And so there was this, this real racial tension that lie between the two, between the Jewish community and the Samaritan community. Now, Samaritan does not mean like this is an area where the Samaritans lived. I mean, they were just a Samaritan, um, I'll, I'll make that a little bit clearer in just a moment. But the word Samaritan actually means, it's, it's a word, ser, 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 sorry, Samar, Samarim, which means keeper of the law, which is something that if you think back about John chapter four, when Jesus says, I have to go through Samaria to where I'm going, and he has a conversation with the woman at a well that is a Samaritan woman, the whole conversation in context of what they're talking about is the law and worship. She is asking him the question, you guys say that we should worship in Jerusalem and our fathers say we should worship on this mountain, which is correct. So we can see that they are a religious community, okay? If you were to go to Jerusalem today or to that area today, there literally is, everybody is living on top of each other. There is so much culturally that's happening in that. Now, we really play it up, and the media really plays it up over here for it to be just a real conflict. But when you go there, like we were just there in November, you see that everybody is living among everyone. So I certainly believe that the Samaritans were just kind of in Jerusalem at some point in time, and he's telling the story, and they just don't like them, which is very much to say some of you guys that grew up in the racial tension that was going on in this nation and still happens in this nation. Let's just be honest. I don't really want to dig into this today. I might go there next week. But the, the context of knowing that there's someone that you just can't stand or don't like because of a prejudice or a racial tension, that's the context of what we're talking about in this story. This is what is happening in this story. Basically, what Jesus pulled on them was this, hey, you know that person that you really hate? That's the one that actually reached out in compassion, not any of you guys. 
Can you imagine the conflict that they're having as listening to, the, to this story that Jesus is telling? Actually, if you want to know how they feel about it, just back up to Luke chapter 9 and read the story where it says that they're heading toward a Samaritan village. Jesus says to the disciples, go in and ask them if we can stay the night here in this village. The Samaritan says, absolutely not. You Jewish people are not coming in here. James and John ask Jesus if they can call down fire and destroy the whole Samaritan village. The disciples, the ones that are following Christ, the Christians want to destroy a whole race of people in this village because they don't like that they're not going to let them into the town. And Jesus' response is this, you don't know what spirit you're of. The Son of Man has come to seek and save those who are lost. I'm not come to bring judgment on them right now. I'm coming to bring mercy on them, and you're about to see it when I go to the cross. And so as he tells this story, hopefully I'm putting you into the context of it, as somebody was passing by, it would be somebody that they would not even have thought about that would have stopped. They would have certainly thought maybe a priest or a Levite or maybe a good Jewish person would stop and help this man out. But Jesus totally flips it on him and says, the person that you hate, that's the one who'll show compassion to you. So this word compassion in verse 33 is actually a Greek word called splagma. It's a great word. We translate this as compassion, but this means pity from your deepest soul. So Jesus is actually talking about you know, emotion and less about action here when you read the storyline where it says that the Samaritan was moved with compassion. It means that he was moved to the deepest part of his soul. It basically means this, and the word kind of sounds this way, right? Splagma kind of sounds like it would come from your gut. Just does, you know? And so it's like Jesus is saying, man, this was such a strong emotion that he could not just pass by. He had to stop, get off of his donkey or his horse or whatever he was on and help this person out. And I think until we're moved like this for people, we'll never stop to get them out of their mess. And the only way that we'll be in that is if we are actually close enough to God to fill his heart for people. It's his compassion. It's not just some human emotion. Some of us in this room, obviously, you have a leaning towards like, let me, just, let me just give you a perfect example. People that hold the cardboard signs at every intersection and they're asking for money and saying that they're, you know, like homeless or just lost my job and I need help or I'm hungry. You would literally give them every bit of the money that you have every time you pass by one of them. It's not healthy, number one. Let me just tell you that some of those people are not real. Some of them are. I'm, I'm being compassionate when I say this. You need to have discernment. So, that being said, maybe I should elaborate a little bit more. You should pray about how God wants you to steward your money, especially if you have a bleeding heart. What I'm talking about here is not so much about your emotion and the way that you are built, and God can use that, but you need to be in direction in relationship with him because when you're close to him, he will talk to you and you'll move in compassion. This is a godly compassion and not so much about people that are compassionate. Because let me tell you, there's a lot of resources out there. There are a lot of people that are not saved, that are not Christians, that are not following God. They're doing a lot for the world. They're moving in compassion. They're moving in love. But this is talking about a godly thing that happens on the inside of you that when you're in close relationship with him, you'll be so moved upon in your emotions that you will stop and you will reach out. We see it time and time again with Jesus in the Gospels when it says he was moved with compassion and then something happened. It's a Holy Spirit. It's something going on on the inside that longs to get out as we reach out in compassion with people. That's what I'm talking about this morning. It's different than just loving people and you love them. It's a godly love. Jesus gives us the golden rule in Matthew 7. He says this, in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. And after this, he goes to the cross, and I believe he kind of ups this game with Paul. When Paul writes in Ephesians 4, he says this, 
Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. See, God is now saying, and Jesus is saying, now because I went to the cross and I have saved you and I live on the inside of you, not only love people the way that you would love people, but love them the way that I would love them. It's not just about what you're feeling or what your emotion is. Get my emotion and my love so that you can reach out in compassion and you treat them like I would treat them. Do you see this transition? I'm gonna ask our our staff guys to come up here and help me with this illustration as we tell this story at the end of this message. Uh, I want you to see something because as they're coming up, we can... Look at this story, and I don't know about you, but you probably have looked at this story, and you probably heard it when you were little, and, and you try to figure out where, where am I in this story? Am I the, you know, out of four people, am I the, the priest? Uh, am I the Levite? Um, I know I should probably, if I'm a Christian, I should probably be the one that stops and helps the person the good Samaritan, but there's also another person in the story, and that's the robber, and so you guys come on up here. So you got the priest, the Levite, the good Samaritan, and the person that's beaten up. There's four people to this story, right? And so many times what we do is we try to figure out and we go, I don't know, man. I'm probably not the priest, you know. May not be the Levite, I really know I should be the good Samaritan because I should be the one that would stop in any moment in, in just compassion and see someone that's hurting and going through something that, that I actually need to be like this good Samaritan versus the ones that didn't stop. Now, that's the way we look at it, okay? That's the way we see this story. Would everybody agree? You're, you're looking at it like, where do I fit in, in these, these three people here? How can I fit into this? Well, their story is completely different. When they're looking at this storyline, I want you to get this. Let's say that you try to put yourself in the position of the priest. Well, you can't do that. Not in the Jewish culture, because the Jewish culture, that's already decided. Like, we don't have a decision on whether we can be the priest in the story. And as they're listening to this, Jesus even goes into the dynamic of this. Okay, I'm not the high priest. I can't be the high priest in this story. And if I'm not from the tribe of Levi, I can't be a Levite either. I can't be the one that's in the house of the Lord taking care of the house of the Lord. Now, what's the context of this story? The context of this story is this, is that both of these individuals, the priest and the Levite, were known as clean because they served in the house of the Lord. The point to this story is this, that they had to remain clean or they had to be unclean by getting off of their animal and helping this person on the side of the road. They had to make a decision. Like, if I do this, I become unclean and I'll have to go through the ceremonial thing to get me back to where I'm clean again to serve in the house of the Lord. In that context, they knew they were neither one, but when he throws out the good Samaritan, they probably don't wanna be the good Samaritan either because they're Jewish and they can't be Samaritan. And the reality of this story, and we do this all the time where we try to put ourselves in one of the three categories of what Jesus is teaching, but in reality, we are really this guy in the story. We are the one that's been beaten, taken advantage of by the enemy. We are the one laying on the side of the road left for half dead by the enemy until Jesus the Good Samaritan comes along. Because Jesus is the one in the story that is willing to become unclean to save us. Thanks, guys. In this story, when you understand that the context of what he's saying is that I am going to, in the future, become this one that's so moved with compassion that I will let my father do this. And this is in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So let's look at the story with you being the one that just got beaten up. And Jesus says, hey, the religious community is not gonna stop to get off of their animal and become unclean for you but I will. I'll get off and take the time and I will take on your sin and the things that you have 
encountered throughout life. I'll take it all on myself. I'll put you on my animal. I'll take you to the end. I'll pay the price to win you back, to get you back to the way that I designed you to be from the beginning. And we are the one that's been beaten and taken advantage of in the story. And so many times we try to put ourselves in the other categories. But that is not the point of what Jesus was saying. And listen, can I say this? Only, only after you come to the Lord and that you're living a life for him, can you even put yourself in the category of the Good Samaritan? And the only reason that you can is because he has moved in on the inside of you in the Holy Spirit. And he is moving in your life so much so that he wants you to move in compassion and reach out to a lost and dying world, those that are left on the side of the road dying. And unless they have a word from you for the kingdom shift to take place, speaking spirit and life over that individual, they have no hope because he's going to use you to co-labor with him to see him get his full reward. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? If you're gonna love people, sometimes you're just gonna have to get dirty and messy. It's not, a, it's not an easy thing to love people the way that God loves people. His mercy is strong. His grace is so strong. And when we're in relationship with him, we can move into that type of compassion. So right now in this moment, I just wanna pray over you. Father, I pray that we would get the context of scripture today and that we would be so moved with your heart that we would not be selfish, that we would not hold things to ourselves. but God, what you're doing in our life, we would be willing to share with others. That God, we would reach out in compassion, that we would see things change around us, that the places that you've put us in that we can truly make a difference as we reach out in compassion. With every head bowed and every eye closed this morning, you you may be here and honestly, you are this person in the story that's just feeling like, man, I've just been beaten down. I've been robbed. The enemy has just really taken advantage of me. And honestly, you've never made a decision for Christ. You've never allowed Jesus to take control and say, hey, I am repenting of my sins. Forgive me, Jesus. You know, move into my life and save me from the mess that I have been in. Maybe you're in this room and you've made a decision like that, but you've walked so far away from God that you can't say, man, I know I'm in a relationship with him and I'm okay. Maybe you just are so far away from the relationship that you started with him that you need to come back today. So whether you're here for the first time or maybe you need to come back. In this moment with every head bowed, every eye closed, I wanna ask you to make this decision today. If you're here and you wanna make that decision, will you just lift up your hand and let me know that I'm talking to you? Yes. You can just slip up your hand and just put it right back down. A few more seconds. You say, I wanna make this decision. I need to come to the Lord. I need to come back to him in relationship. I need to get things right with Jesus, yes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The Bible says that we have to believe in our heart that Jesus is the Son of God, that he came to take our sins and we repent of our sins. We have to believe that in our heart and then we also have to confess it with our mouth. It's the way into the kingdom. And so I'm gonna ask you, everyone all over this room, we're gonna pray a prayer together and if you lifted up your hand right now or maybe you're watching us online, and you wanna pray this prayer, pray it out loud. It's a confession from your heart saying, I confess today that you are Lord. Let's pray this together. Dear Jesus, thank you for moving in my life. I give you my sins today. I repent, wash me clean, and give me your power to walk in freedom. Amen, amen. Come on, can we celebrate with those that prayed that prayer? Why don't you go ahead and stand up with me today? Thank you for joining us online. If you enjoyed the message, you can subscribe to our podcast, follow us on all of our social media platforms, and help us reach others by giving at freedomchurchchattanooga.com slash give.